Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Angela Greiling Keen, this year's National Press Club president and a reporter with Bloomberg News. We are honored to have all of you here in our audience tonight, and especially honored to have our distinguished panel of journalists who covered the assassination of President Kennedy. According to gridiron historian Todd Purdom, the National Press Club played a bit role in the fateful day because the, uh, some of the journalists retired here that evening after returning to Washington. UPI's Merriman Smith, who of course was first with the story, was said to have showed off his bruises that he sustained that day at the National Press Club bar. He of course got the bruises because of his AP competitor pummeling him when he wouldn't let the AP reporter get to the phone in the press car. So we are very excited to hear from our panel tonight. I will turn the evening over to Gil Klein, who is the 1994 National Press Club president, a professor at American University, and the chairman this year of our History and Heritage Committee at the Press Club. Please help me welcome Gil Klein and the panel. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the National Press Club. As uh, Angela said, I'm uh, Gil Klein. I'm the, uh, uh, I am a American University journalism professor at the Washington Semester Program. Uh, I'm a past club president and important for this event, I'm chairman of the club's History and Heritage Committee. Where were you when Kennedy was shot? If you are my age, or older, that is a question you have heard repeatedly during the past 50 years. And you always know the answer, usually in great detail. That moment is seared into all of our, all of our brains. For me, it was the eighth grade study hall at the Pingree School when the math teacher, Mr. Newcomb, came in and announced it. Uh, and I was glued to the television set for three days. And I'm still haunted by the sound of the drumbeat as the caisson carrying the president's body crossed Memorial Bridge to Arlington Cemetery. And since it is Walter Cronkite's birthday today, I have to add that also seared into the nation's consciousness is Con Cronkite's announcement of Kennedy's death as he took off his glasses and said, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Then he looked up at a clock off camera and said, some 38 minutes ago. Between Pearl Harbor and the 9-11 terrorist attacks, it remains the pivotal single moment in American history. It is an event that still is hotly debated and relived yearly during the past half century. A tsunami of commentary and recollections is engulfing America to mark the 50th anniversary. So much is packed into that moment, not only in American history and culture, but also in journalism history as television news suddenly came of age. It was a pivotal moment indeed. We are fortunate to have with us four people for whom where were you when Kennedy is shot is more than a casual question. They were journalists in Dallas that day. What started as covering a routine presidential trip became the defining story of their careers and what careers they have had. First, Bob Schieffer. CBS Senior News uh, correspondent, uh, one of the most trusted names in television news today, a presidential deba debate moderator, a winner of the National Press Club's Fourth Estate Award for his career accomplishments. On November 22nd, uh, 1963, he was a cub reporter for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and he has an amazing story to uh, tell about what happened to him that day. Next, Mr. Jim Lehrer, like Bob, a trusted name in television news, a repeat presidential debate moderator, a winner of the Fourth Estate Award. He is the journalist who created and, and defined quality news on public broadcasting for decades. On November 22, 1963, he was the federal court reporter for the Dallas Times-Herald. He was sent to the airport to report on the landing of Air Force One. A simple procedural question he asked a Secret Service agent has lived with him ever since. And he has written a book, a, a novel about it that's just out now. Uh, it's called Top Down, a novel of the Kennedy assassination. And I'm sure he has more to say about what happened that day. Also, the book starts at a National Press Club fifth anniversary discussion of this. So uh, 
it just keeps coming around. Now, uh, Marianne Means uh, was a columnist for Hearst newspapers for decades, casting her acerbic eye on the events and characters that shaped the latter half of the 20th century and the opening years of the 21st. A pioneer in breaking the gender barrier in journalism, Marianne, on November 22, 1963, was the only woman reporter in the motorcade when the shots rang out. And finally, Sid Davis, who was a White House correspondent for Westinghouse Broadcasting for years, traveling hundreds of thousands of miles with nine presidents. He was a vice president and Washington bureau chief for NBC News. On November 22, 1963, uh, not only was he in the motorcade counting the shots as they were fired, but he ended up on Air Force One as one of three reporters who witnessed Lyndon Johnson being sworn in as president. This is an amazing group of journalists. So let's get started. Now, could each of you give us a brief recap of how you got to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963? How and why did you get into journalism? What series of jobs got you to the one you had that day? And what were you doing in the weeks leading up to that day? And what was your assignment on that day? Mary Ann, do you like to start? Well, of course, my assignment was the presidency, which it always was. But uh, it seemed that there was something different about this day. The car, the convertible, everybody in it was very cranky. Let's get to that, but right now we want to get to how did, how, how did your career get you to uh, being in the motorcade on that day? Can you tell us a little bit well, about it? Because I was the first, in the first press bus uh -huh. behind. Okay. That was luck. Well, we'll get to that, but now let's go to Bob. Uh, can you tell us uh, how you got to be a cub reporter? It, uh, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Well, I, wa the, I was the uh, night police reporter is exactly uh, what I was. Uh, I made $115 a week, uh, went to work at 6 o'clock at night and got off at 2.30 in the morning, and I thought it was the single best job that anyone could ever have. I never thought <laughs> that I would have a better job. It's been kind of that way for me uh, through most of the jobs I've had. The one I had always seemed like the best job you could possibly have, including the one that I have now. But in those days, uh, police news was very big at the Star-Telegram, uh, and we did a lot of, of uh, police-related uh, stories. And it was actually kind of a key assignment at the Star-Telegram uh, to be uh, the police reporter. And I had gotten hired because the police reporter, his name was Phil Record, uh, had been promoted to Night City Editor. And I had been working in the news department of a little radio station in Fort Worth, and uh, he would see me at various wrecks. We, we said we covered the three R's in those days, wrecks, rapes, and robberies. And, <laughs> and we got to know each other at, at these uh, events, and so when he got promoted to uh, Night City Editor, he recommended me for the job. And that's, that's how I came to the Star-Telegram. Okay, and uh, uh, Sid, how, uh, how did you, you were already a uh, White House radio correspondent traveling with presidents. How did you get to that spot? Well, I had started out in journalism in Youngstown, Ohio. <laughs> I covered the mayor, city council, uh, pimps, whores, and the mafia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and the mafia was the most fun. The most, <laughs> they were. And uh, I think that prepared me well for coming to Washington. <laughs> and oh, I had, a, stole I had my a wonderful line. opportunity, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company. We were a smaller company, we were a group broadcaster, but we had seven wonderful radio stations, five TV stations, and a Washington bureau that eventually had 20 people in it, which was, uh, those were the days of great broadcasting. And I was assigned to the White House. I'd covered Kennedy in the 60 campaign. And when uh, Kennedy won, I was with him. I'd covered Nixon part of the time, and I covered Kennedy for the rest of the time. And when I ended up with Kennedy, they said, well, you know Salinger, you know all the people, so you go to the White House. And I was with Kennedy in the White House until we went to Dallas. I, uh, we were was, all very lucky to be with Kennedy. That's right. That's right. Now let's first go to um, 
Uh, Jim and tell us, how did you, you were at the Dallas Times Herald, how did you end up there? Well, I, uh, I went first to the, to the Dallas Morning News. I was in the, uh, was in the Marine Corps and was about to get out and I wrote four letters asking, I already had gone to journalism school and I wrote four letters uh, asking for jobs, one to the Associated Press, one to the United Press, one to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and one to the Dallas News. Uh, UP didn't answer me. AP said, we'll get back to you. Fort Worth said, we don't have an opening. Dallas News said, come see us. So I went to work for, Dallas, for the Dallas News. Two years later, I went to the Times Herald, which separately owned afternoon newspaper in Dallas and I was the federal reporter on November 22nd, 1963. It, it may have been a routine presidential visit for others, but in Dallas, it was a huge event. Everybody on the city staff was involved in covering that, that visit because it was right on our deadlines. It was the whole thing was gonna be, you know, then the Kennedys were only gonna be in Dallas for three, three or so hours. So everybody had, to, everybody, every reporter on the staff was involved. My assignment was to cover the arrival of the Kennedys at Love Field, and then stay there and cover the departure. Now, uh, that gets us right, segues right into, uh, since you, both you and uh, Bob worked for local newspapers, how did they prepare for this trip? Uh, do you remember, was the as you just said, the president's arrival was a huge story, and what were the political undercurrents uh, that led to Kennedy coming to Dallas that Terrible. Day? Yeah. Well, well, it, it, it depends on who you were and where you were uh, about, the, about the undercurrents. In my case, I, as the federal reporter, my assignment was to write about the security buildup, uh -huh. uh, lead, lead up to uh, the, the event. And I wrote, in fact, the, uh, I wrote the motorcade story and the, with a map was in the front page of the Dallas Times Herald, and it was in Lee Harvey Oswald's effects when they arrested him in, uh, in Oak Cliff. But the buildup to, to, the, to the visit uh, remember, people always remember the bad side about the Dallas newspapers, particularly the Dallas Morning News. It was a right-wing newspaper, anti-Kennedy. Some of the things they wrote were awful. Uh, the Times-Herald was had a kind of a plain vanilla editorial page. But the fact is, on the news side, on both of those newspapers, they were professionally run. And there was a, there, in those days, it was very old-fashioned. They had a, they had a fire, firewall between the editorial page and the news side, and the state news reporting was done by both the Dallas News and the Times Herald, and we both reported uh, all of the right-wing stuff and all of that, but not, I promise you, as the, as the federal reporter in charge of the security stuff, I had access to the Secret Service and to the FBI and to everybody. There was no thought that, yes, there might be some protest, there might some nuts might hold up some posters or something, but there was no special threat considered uh, uh, toward, uh, a threat to the Kennedys uh, as a result of coming to Dallas, although some people thought there might, might be, but not, not you know, the officials. Uh, those were the days. <laughs> yeah. in, in Fort Worth, it was the biggest story of the year. Presidents didn't travel very much in those days, and uh, this was she quite, didn't an travel unusual, at all. Mm -hmm. quite an unusual event. And the reason President Kennedy was coming to Texas, there were two reasons. The main reason he was coming was to raise money for the coming campaign. And he also, uh, the, there were the, the Democratic Party in those days in Texas was composed of the conservative Democrats. They were led by Governor Conley. And then the liberal Democratic wing, which was led by Senator Ralph Yarbrough. And they were always feuding. And, and Kennedy wanted to get the two sides together before they went into the 64 uh, campaign because he knew it was going to uh, be crucial. Well, he flew first to San Antonio, then to Houston, and then he flew up to Fort Worth the night before he was to go to Dallas. And he was overwhelmingly welcomed there. 10,000 people turned out at Carswell Air Force Base just to see Air Force One land. They cheered him all the way into the downtown area where he spent the night at the Hotel Texas. The local uh, people there had put together a committee that uh, gathered up these priceless pieces of art and hung them in the suite of Van Gogh, Picasso. Uh, Fort Worth just went all out. They were determined to show a, a, a President and Mrs. Kennedy a big welcome. Everybody called Jackie, Jackie. They didn't call her Mrs. Kennedy. And they cheered her more than they, uh, they cheered the president. So, he got up the next morning in Fort Worth, 
spoke to an outdoor rally where he, again, he was overwhelmingly uh, well received and then went in and spoke at a uh, breakfast given by the Chamber of Commerce and again was, uh, got a wonderful, wonderful welcome. So th I think that's why it was such a shock when what happened happened just, you know, 20 minutes later when he uh, flew uh, flew over to Dallas. And the reception and, in Dallas, the public reception in Dallas was also yeah, very positive. Good. Yeah, I mean, there were a few protesters with signs, because uh, I was, I covered that at, the, at Love Field, and, uh, but they were, I mean, they were giving huge, yeah. huge cheers to them, and all along the motorcade route, particularly in, right in downtown Dallas. Mm -hmm. it and was, then uh, the gunshots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But let yeah. me just, just kind of set the stage for this, and just let you know, you all know what happened after those shots rang out. But when it happened, those of us were there, we were absolutely stunned. We didn't know what this meant. They closed off the borders with Mexico. We didn't know if this was the beginning of World War III. Uh, the Strategic Air Command, uh, they had a SAC base in Fort Worth. That's where the nuclear bombers were. Uh, that's where the nuclear arsenal was, where many of the bombs were kept. Uh, we knew that if, if there was going to be a nuclear exchange, that we would be one of the first targets uh, of Soviet missiles. So in addition to just the shock and, and not understanding what does this mean, what is this all about, there was kind of a feeling of terror that hung over all of it because we yeah. didn't know what this meant or what was about to happen. Bill Brennan sent a, a note to, to Johnson, the first thing he could, saying it wasn't us. Before we get too far ahead, though, uh, Jim, can you tell us a story about uh, uh, the arrival at uh, Love Field and tell us, this is when you can tell us where this, okay. this came from. Um, I, the, uh, because it was right on our deadline, uh, our newspaper, a cheap newspaper for some reason, uh, paid to have an open telephone line right there by the fence <laughs> line, right where the Air Force One was going to come in, so I could just pick up the phone and talk to rewrite in the old-fashioned way. And, You're one uh, of a kind. Yeah, 20 minutes, when we got the word that the plane was going to take off from Fort Worth, uh, I was testing the phone. The rewrite man said to me, well, are they going to have the bubble top up on the car, on the presidential limousine? And I said, well, I couldn't see because the cars were down a, a ramp. Uh, and uh, he said, well, would you mind going looking? I said, why? And he said, well, I'm going to be right under a deadline. But I'd just like to know where the bubble top. Bubble top had been mentioned. I'd written the stories about it. The bubble top was mentioned only in passing. And the advanced story is that if it was raining, that they would have the bubble top. It was strictly a weather situation. It didn't have anything to do with security. And, uh, but he just, the rewrite man just wanted to know. So when he wrote the story under deadline, he would know whether the bubble top was up. So anyway, I go down to the ramp. And the cars were all parked there. They were all lined up. And the presidential limousine and did, in fact, have the bubble top up because it had been raining that morning in Dallas, but it had cleared. The, rewrite, the Secret Service man who was standing there, I happened to know because he was a local Dallas guy. And I said, uh, I looked, pointed, I said, you know, rewrite wants to know if you're going to keep the bubble top up. And he looked up and he said, well, it's clear. He asked for a, a Secret Service agent, had a two way radio. Is it check downtown? Guy, blah, 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 come back and says, clear downtown. So my, the agent says, lose the bubble top. So the agents who are standing around, they start taking the bubble top off. Now the bubble top was it was not bulletproof. It was it was one quarter inch plexiglass. Put six pieces of plexiglass put together with snaps, and it was strictly a weather thing. Kennedy, as president, had said, I never want that bubble top off. I mean, up over me. I, if we're going to have a public event, I don't want the people seeing me as somebody under glass, for God's sake. And, uh, but, he, but just put it up if the, if the weather was bad. So the Secret, the, the Secret Service had no, no, there was no option. Uh, the guy just uh, did the right thing by taking the bubble top down. But, but uh, there was stuff afterward, and there's been stuff written about it. And by the, the context of my novel is that, that if the bubble top had stayed up, there are two theories. One is that even though it wasn't bulletproof, it, it, would, it could have deflected the shots. Or it was possible Oswald might not have even taken the shots, because a lot of people did think it was bulletproof. Or the, the shots could have hit the, the little rims that put the pieces together. That was one theory. In other words, Kennedy would not have been hurt 
much less killed if the bubble top had stayed up. That's one theory. The other theory is that if he had taken the shots, those, those, that glass would have just gone into many shards and probably killed everybody, both the Kennedys, both the Connellys, and the two uh, Secret Service agents. Nobody made a big to-do about it at the time. It was barely mentioned by the Warren Commission. Nobody did any reenactments or whatever because it was not an issue. Uh, because Kennedy had said the bubble top had to come down if the, if the weather was so, there was nothing, there was no controversy about it. I made a novel uh, out of it because of the effect it had on, a, on a, a fictional Secret Service agent, that's all. But didn't the actual Secret Service agent say? Oh, well, yeah, they, at that midnight that night, you talk about uh, Bob's thing about the, the uh, how everybody, nobody knew what, it was, it was I, I spent you know, the whole night, well, I spent all two days at the police station and uh, the most incredible time I've ever spent anywhere in my life or ever will again. It Are was the, right? the, the collision of, 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 uh, right? of feelings, uh, of dis first of disbelief. Good God Almighty, did this really happen? Is the president really dead? Oh my God Almighty, did it really happen in Dallas? Oh my God. And then, uh, well, uh, uh, what if it really was? What if this guy Oswald what really was a Russian defector, and what if it, it really was Russia? Ah, we got World War III. Oh, well, no, no, maybe it was the Cuban. Oh, my God, we got to bomb Havana. All of that kind of stuff. And then, but for us as individuals, then we were, we were, we were standing around, and it was, all, it was all cops and agents and reporters of all kinds, sizes and, and, and uh, uh, accents, and uh, we were all just kind of milling about it. And then every once in a while, there would be this, we'd just be overcome with absolute grief as individuals. And then we'd all realize, oh my God, we all have, still have a job to do. What in the hell happened and all that? It was, just, it was just, just crazy. Midnight, I was told there was a meeting going on at the police chief's office up on the third floor. And it was where it was quiet. I went up there and a couple of other reporters and we waited. There was, the door was closed, didn't know who was in the, in the meeting. The door finally opened, out came the police chief and five other guys in suits, and one of them was the Secret Service agent. And he was an old man, probably 42, 43 years old. <laughs> and he came over to me, and he says, this is the way I remember it. Now, I'm, there's a, a lot of you are also in the same line of work that, I, that, we're, that we're in, and we all know that eyewitnesses are the worst people to talk to, et cetera, and you gotta, I don't, then my re recollection is that he came over to, I know he came over to me, and I think he had tears in his eyes, and he said to me, Jim, I just hadn't taken the bubble top off. And then I thought, oh, holy, <laughs> wow, if I just hadn't asked the question, of course, and all that. But the fact of the matter is, as I said earlier, there was no decision to be made. But from his point of view, from his personal point of view, there was a decision to be made, and it was that point that I related fictionalized and made it in the novel. I said, uh, and Marianne, you were in the motorcade. T tell us first a little bit about how, how motorcades are set up, where were you in it, and, uh, uh, and then we'll get into the crucial moment. Well, the motorcade uh, involves about 10 or 15 cars. Now that's much longer than that because security is much more uh, heavy, it's heavier security today. The, Motorcade then, uh, the sheriff and uh, the police officials were in the first car in, in Dallas. I won't go through all the cars. The presidential limousine was about number three. The uh, wire car that follows the president closest, we always have a wire car that uh, has four pool reporters, two wire service reporters, a broadcaster, a print person in the wire car. That's about four cars behind the presidential limousine. I was on press bus number one, which was eight car lengths behind the presidential limousine. Me too. And uh, Marion, were you on press bus one? Mm -hmm. And uh, we got, as, as, as both Jim and uh, Bob have said, uh, Texas really turned out. Uh, we had some trepidation coming from Washington that there might be some problems because there were two events that had happened prior to Kennedy's going to Dallas. One was uh, Lyndon Johnson and Mrs. Johnson about a year before that were cornered in a hotel lobby and uh, roughed up a little bit verbally uh, by a group of people who were very conservative and didn't like Lyndon Johnson for, another, for other reasons, perhaps. I covered that, I was there for that. Go and, ahead, sorry. And uh, the, other, the uh, other incident was Adlai Stevenson a few months before uh, who came to town and the mob came around him. They were against coexistence and uh, 
had some clackers saying so, and accidentally or intentionally, and I uh, take the woman's word for it, she said it was an accident, she bumped him on the head with a placard. <laughs> but that was the worst we expected. We did not expect anything more uh, uh, rowdier or obnoxious than that. Uh, no one expected, certainly, there to be an assassin in Dallas. The crowds, as the two gentlemen pointed out, were warm, enthusiastic, exciting, at, both at uh, Fort Worth and at Love Field. And as we went downtown in the motorcade approaching Elm and Houston streets, it couldn't have been nicer. The weather was perfect for a uh, presidential <laughs> motorcade. Governor Conley and Mrs. Conley were in the limousine on the jump seats in the presidential limousine. Uh, the president and Mrs. Kennedy, the president was seated on the right in the rear, and Mrs. Kennedy was on the left. On press bus number one, as I said, we were eight car lengths behind the presidential car, so we were about right under the sixth floor window of the school book depository when the shots were fired. Mm -hmm. And there was no doubt in my mind that we heard three explosions. One of the correspondents on the, uh, on the bus was Bob Pierpoint of CBS, he had some knowledge of weaponry, and he jumped out of his seat, and he says, that's gunfire. And then we all agreed it was not the motorcycles backfiring. It was not firecrackers. It had to be worse than that. And when we looked up ahead to the presidential limousine, we saw it just take off. By that time, the crowd had heard the noise as well, and we saw people scattering, some jumping in front of the bus as we were proceeding. Now, the presidential limousine uh, probably attained speeds somewhere around 60 or 70 miles an hour to get the president to a hospital. That's the first thing the Secret Service did. They knew exactly where to go. And the press bus could not keep up with the presidential limousine. We were shouting at the bus driver to catch the limousine. We couldn't do that. The bus driver did the next best thing. He took us to the trademark where the speech was going to take place. When we got to the trademark, we couldn't find any sign that the president was there, and that was the first ominous sign that something serious had happened. When we passed Dealey Plaza, you could see parents shielding their children, putting their bodies on top of their kids on what they called the grassy knoll. I saw women kicking off their shoes so they could run better in the grass. I saw a motorcycle policeman trying to get up the knoll with his motorcycle, and he flipped over and fell off the motorcycle. I saw another policeman on the ground pounding the, the turf with his hands in frustration because he was unable to, to move. They didn't know where the shots had come from at that point but they had come from the school book depository. Uh, I filed my first story from the trademark. I called my office to my bureau chief, Jim Schneider, was his name, wonderful guy, who put me on there immediately. He told me that the wires had already had a flash on the wires, that President Kennedy was in the hospital, a place called Parkland Hospital. I filed my story. I got out of the building. I ran into the street with my Olivetti portable and waved it in the air, and a guy in a white Cadillac picked me up. He said, are you a reporter? And I said, yes and he got me to Parkland Hospital. When I got to Parkland Hospital, I got near the limousine, the bubble top was off the car. Secret Service agents were trying to clean up the back seat. Clint Hill, Mrs. Kennedy's agent, had already attempted that, and he had taken off his suit coat. And Secret Service has this congenital feeling that they protect the president at all times, and I think Clint didn't want the, anybody to see what that back seat looked like. When I got out of, the, was too uh, out of a car, to, uh, take a, to take a look at the back seat, one of the correspondents with us, Hugh Sighty at Time Magazine, had already taken a look. I went over to, to see what was going on, to see how bad the situation was, and I remember Hugh saying, don't look, it's too horrible. Uh, I ran inside at the hospital and they kicked me out, so I had to go upstairs to a second floor. I commandeered a telephone and I started filing my story. And there's a lot more to it, uh, but uh, I, did hear, I did hear the first words about the president. Uh, being uh, mortally wounded. Uh, while I was on the air, I saw uh, on this, uh, this telephone I'd commandeered, I saw a group of my friends, uh, reporters, talking to two priests. And one of the reporters was Jerry Terhorst of the uh, Detroit newspapers. And he waved me over, and I left the phone. I, I turned it over back to Washington. I left the phone, I went over, and I, just as I got there, one of the priests said, he's dead all right. I just gave him the last rites. And I also heard him say, and I told Mrs. Kennedy that I think his soul had not yet left his body. Uh, I ran back to the phone and I told my bureau chief, take me off the air, I gotta talk to you about something. And we, I was off the air and he was off the air and I said, Jim, there's a priest here who says the president's dead. 
And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, what do you want to do? And we both agreed that we would not put it on the air. We would wait for an official announcement. I, I knew that a priest uh, would know what a dead person looked like. And if I had seen the situation, I probably would have put it on the air because the, the wound, and there was no way that any human being could have survived the wound. There was a gaping hole uh, in the president's skull. It blew off half his head. Yes, that's right. Marion, what so, do, you, do you remember about the being in the motorcade? Well, uh, similar bits and pieces of what Sid remembers. But I was one of the first people to arrive, too. And there was nothing there. I got there, there was an empty car. And Lem and whoever was Clint trying to clean up the car, they were too late because his car, inside his car was nothing but speckled stuff with little white dots all over it. And at first I didn't realize what I was seeing. And then of course I did. And uh, there's a great story that uh, I'm sure you all have heard, and maybe you were there, about uh, the fight in the press car between the Associated Press and United Press International. For, you were talking about how essential it was to get the story out, and certainly for those people it was. A little history. The, the wire <laughs> cars provided, it, it's a, it was usually a khaki-covered uh, car owned by the telephone company. Uh, AT&T usually provided a wire car because it had a telephone in it, and these were called radio telephones, which were nothing like a cell phone today. They were, the trunk of the car was a whole transmitting station to, for this one, hand, one handset that you had. Merriman Smith was a White House correspondent, uh, a, uh, uh, a legend in his own time, really. He covered uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he covered Truman, and uh, he always felt that that telephone belonged to him. He always sat in the front seat next to the telephone. And, Turned uh, out to be a he wise also move. He, owned, he also thought he owned Air Force One. But uh, <laughs> Smitty was, was outstanding, and when he was in the motorcade and heard the shots, he was well prepared for what he did. As he was dictating the story, and, and incidentally, there, the other reporters in the wire car, a television radio person, newspaper person, and uh, a, uh, another wire service, the Associated Press. But Smitty always had the front seat. And the other reporter in the back was a, a columnist for the Associated Press named Jack Bell. Uh, he wanted to see the political side of the story, so the regular White House correspondent rode the press bus, and Jack Bell wanted to get a sense of the politics in Texas. Smitty would not give up the telephone. As they were speeding toward the uh, hospital, Merriman Smith, was dictating, but what, Mer what Smitty did was that after every phrase or every sentence, Merriman Smith asked the office to repeat after him what he had said. And so the Associated Press reporter uh, was probably having conniptions at this point because he was trying to get the telephone and say, why are you repeating your story again? But Smitty was not gonna let go of the phone. Now there are differing opinions about what happened in the wire car. My guess is it was, it was not a fierce battle. Jack Bell was in the back seat, very hard from the back seat to wrest that telephone out of Merriman Smith. And I think that what it was was a tussle more than anything else. But Smith never gave up the telephone, and that's been a legendary story. That is legendary. So, uh, uh, Bob, you were in Fort Worth, and Jim, your assignment uh, was at least temporary over. Uh, how did you hear about the shooting? And Jim, what were you told to do at that point? I had uh, gone back to the, uh, to the restaurant to have um, lunch when I was meeting these reporters uh, after I'd reported every morsel that I, could, that I had back to the city desk and uh, the, the motorcade had gone off and uh, I, went in, I, was going, I walked into the restaurant um, and just as I walked in there, the waitress came, came screaming, crying. He said, they shot Kennedy, Conley too. And I turned around and ran as fast as I could, found a telephone on the, on the, on the wall. Uh, they used to, you remember those things they used to have called pay phones? Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I 
through some miracle, I was able to get through to the city desk just like that, and I had the city editor on the phone, and I said, is this true? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what happened? What's, what's going on? He said, we don't know yet. And he said, what do you want me to do? He said, okay, go to Park. Parkland was very close to Love Field. He said, we got some people that we think are already there, but go by there and check, and then go to the police station. And um, so that's what I did. I drove by Parkland, I got to Parkland, there was no place to park, there was absolute chaos. I just left my car sitting out in the middle of the street, ran out over and I could tell, and I saw, I saw one of our guys, he just waved at me, so I went, got back in the car and went to the police station. And I got there the same time that I was there when they brought in Lee Harvey Oswald and all that, I broke down, I, had the, I still had the notebook that one of my daughters is misplaced, that, where I misspelled his name and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so uh, I spent, uh, not only the next two days, I spent the next eight months doing nothing but the assassination. I was assigned then by the newspaper to, uh, to cover the investigation and, uh, and stay on it, and so I did. Well, I was this asleep. Is, this is the moment, Bob. I want to, this is when you can tell I was asleep amazing. when it happened. <laughs> and, and here is why. I didn't get off work till 2.30 uh, in the morning at the paper, but uh, when President Kennedy flew into Fort Worth the night before all this happened, we kept the Fort Worth Press Club open for all the visiting White House press corps, and we were all really excited about it because we were going to get to see all these bylines that we only knew by their bylines, and so this was a big deal for us. So as soon as we got the paper to bed, the Night City editor and I went over to the, uh, to the press club, and they were all there. Well, a lot of the uh, uh, members of the visiting uh, White House press corps, for some reason, had heard about this joint in, Wash in, uh, in Fort Worth called The Cellar, and it was a coffee house, and the great attraction of this, <laughs> this coffee house is that the waitresses wore underwear. That was their <laughs> uniform. It would, it would be kind of chaste today, but in those days it was thought to be rather racy. And as the nights went on, uh, they would get up on these on tables and dance. And <laughs> they kept, and I never saw this happen, but the way they kept people buying coffee, because they didn't sell liquor coffee? there, the way they kept people buying coffee you expect us to at the coffee? cellar, it, this is at the cellar. This is a coffee house. The way they kept people there is they said, you know, these girls late in the evening and the music really gets going, they sometimes take off those uniforms. And I never saw one of them do it, but it kept people there to all hours of the night. And while we were there, uh, we discovered that uh, some members, uh, off-duty uh, Secret Service agents, had come down there with us, so they were down there too. Well, it was very, very early in the morning by the time I got home and went to bed. So when all of this happened in Dallas, I was asleep. My brother came in, woke me up, and he said, you better get up. The president's been shot in Dallas. So I was in a total fog. And mind you, remember, we've had a lot of violent events since then, but nothing like this had ever happened to people who were alive at the time that this happened. We, we just didn't know what to make of it. I got dressed as fast as I could. I'll make this a short story. I, I could to the paper. I went up to the city desk. It was total bedlam. Somebody had told all the reporters, go to Dallas, call us when you get there. There was nobody there to answer the phones on the city desk. So I sat down and tried to help answer the phones and a woman called in and said, is there anybody there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, well, lady, I mean, I almost hung up the phone. And I said, lady, uh, we don't run a taxi service here, and besides, the president's been shot. And she said, yes, I heard it on the radio. I think my son is the one they've arrested. And it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. <laughs> so I waved to the city editor, I <laughs> asked her where she lived, and another reporter and I went out to the west side of Fort Worth to pick her up. And the reason we took another reporter, I had a Triumph sports car in those days. It was a two-seater, and I thought, well, I can't drive this woman over to Dallas in this with the top down and it took about 20 minutes to get the top up so Bill Foster who was the auto editor of the paper uh, the local car dealers would always give him a car to drive every week and he would drive it and then he would do a little review of it in the Sunday paper well as you can imagine these were usually pretty good reviews free car <laughs> free paper free gas you can see how all that worked but the Mores were a little different in those days. So I went to Bill, I said, what kind of car have you got? And he said, well, I have a, a Cadillac. And I said, that's great. 
we went back, told the city editor, and we headed out there, and, and there, standing on the curb at the address this woman had given us, was this little woman in a, a white practical nurse's uniform, big black horn-rimmed glasses, and carrying a little a blue uh, travel case, like you'd put your bowling shoes in or something like that. And uh, so I got in the back seat with her, and uh, Bill drove, and uh, we drove her to Dallas. And, and I interviewed her on the way, and it was a very strange interview because she immediately began to talk about how no one would feel sorry for her, and everyone would feel sorry for his wife and would give her money, and she, the mother, would be forgotten and would starve to, to death. It was the most bizarre conversation, some of it so bizarre that I didn't even put some of the quotes in, in the story that I wrote uh, for the Star-Telegram for the, for the next morning's edition. I mean, I had plenty of quotes, and, but I just kept thinking to myself, how would you feel if your son had been arrested for shooting the president? And I, I sort of gave her the benefit of the doubt and didn't put some of these, these remarks that she made uh, uh, in my story. But uh, drove her to Dallas. In those days, we never told people who we were unless they ask. We didn't lie about it, but if they thought we were cops, we let them think that. And I always wore a snap brim hat, you know, when I was covering police, so I'd look like a detective. So when I got to the Dallas police station, I uh, walked up to the first uniform cop I saw, and I said, uh, I I'm the one who brought uh, Oswald's mother over here. Is there some place we can put her where these reporters won't be bothering her? And... <laughs> Well, I was only 26, right? you know. and, and so they found me a little office, and it was back in the burglary squad, and it was great because there was a phone back there, so I could go out into the hallway where our reporters were by then with all those hundreds of people like Jim Lehrer who were there, <laughs> and I could gather up information from them and then go back and call it in on our phone, and, uh, you know, Young reporters today in this age of cell phones, they don't understand. In yeah. those days, if you didn't have a phone, you didn't have a story. And so we had a phone. And so I would go back there and call it in, and we kept churning out these extras. Well, hours passed. Uh, and finally, she said, do you think they'd let me see my son? And I said, well, I, I don't know. And so I said, but I'll ask. So I went to Captain Will Fritz, who was the chief of homicide, and I said, you know, she'd, she'd like to see her son. And he's Things were very, very informal in those days, and that's what you kind of have to understand. There was no Miranda law. There was no law where you had to inform people they had a right to an attorney and all that. There were no PR people. We dealt directly with the cops, talked to them. And he said, yeah, we, we probably ought to do that. And uh, so one thing led to another, and we were head led to this little holding room off the jail. And uh, by now, they had put his wife back there with the baby that she had brought to the police station with, with the mother. And I'm not sure Mrs. Oswald, the mother, had ever, I mean, the, the grandmother had ever seen this baby before. She and Marina didn't get along at all. But anyway, we were all headed back, and we were standing there in this holding room off the jail. And I'm thinking, my God, this is going to be the biggest story I'll ever get. Maybe I'll get to interview this, this guy when they bring him down. And finally, a guy standing over in the corner said, who are you? And I said, <laughs> what? And he said, are you a reporter? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, son, he said, you get out of here. He said, I might kill you if I ever see you again, or words to that effect. And I think he meant it. And I, uh, as you always do as a reporter, I, of course, blamed it on the city editor and excused myself and, and, and got out of there. And I've always said that was the biggest interview I almost got but didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, to this day, one of the greatest adventures that I think any, any uh, young reporter could ever have. And I look back on it and it, it seems almost surreal. I think, you know, did this really happen? But it really happened. And uh, the informality that's just of that, the way it was. The informality of that time in the police station. They, they would move a couple of times. They moved Oswald from one office to the other. And, and one, the first time they moved him from one office to the other, right, all of us were there. And I went right there, right to Oswald. And I said, did you kill? I asked him, did you kill the president? And he said, I didn't kill anybody. And I wrote that <laughs> down. Trust me, I wrote that down. Of course, he wasn't just talking to me. He was talking to where. And then a few minutes later, he came back. And somebody else, I mean, it was... We, and we could have, you know, we could touch they, him. They brought him out there because they wanted to make sure people didn't think they'd beat him right. up. 
That's right. And they wanted to make sure everybody saw that he and was. And he had some scars because yeah. they, they, had, they had had a scuffle when they arrested him in, in Oak Cliff. They wanted to make sure there weren't any new scars. Absolutely mm -hmm. right. That's why they kept showing. They, kept, they showed him that night at a big press thing where I stood yep. next to Jack uh, Ruby and didn't even know who in the hell he was. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, Sid and uh, Marianne, you were in this strange town uh, covering the biggest story of all time. Tell me a little bit about how, how did you go about that? Did, you know, these guys knew where Parkland Hospital was. <laughs> they, they knew how to get into the police station and pose as uh, what, whatever they were. Uh, uh, we just uh, happened to be there, but there weren't any phones. That you, you, couldn't get the, you couldn't get a phone out? No, I got in a, in a fight with a, when we realized how badly damaged Kennedy was. Half his head was blown off. We uh, rushed to try to find some phones, and we couldn't get any. I, I uh, when I first got in the hospital, I, I got a phone and I had a young uh, nurse's aide uh, hold it for me, mm -hmm. so I could go. I had some freedom. I was very, I was lucky. I had a phone like that. But the sad part of it is I never got her name, and I. Was unable. I never thanked her for it, but I did have a telephone, and I had this woman hold it for me, so I could run back and forth and get information. Uh, if you get to the announcement of Kennedy's death, uh, while we while we knew for several minutes that Kennedy was dead from the priest, it was a it seemed like an eternity waiting for the official announcement, but it was only minutes, probably five minutes at most, when Malcolm killed up the assistant press secretary. Uh, came, came upstairs to the second floor, and uh, Pierre Salinger, the sec press secretary, was on his way to uh, Asia for a conference with the Secretary of State. So Kildup was brand new. He was uh, not even number two, but he did a magnificent job of handling the situation. Uh, they commandeered a nursing training office, and Kildup came in there. We followed him into the room. He got behind a desk. His uh, cheeks were streaked with tears. He'd been crying. He had just left uh, President Johnson in the emergency area. He went into the emergency area at some point after the, uh, uh, Kennedy uh, was pronounced dead by the medical people. And he said, he looked at Johnson, this is uh, Kilduff's own story to me. He said, I looked at him and I said, Mr. President. And he said, he, he, Johnson seemed stunned at being called Mr. President. Kilduff thought he was the first person to call Lyndon Johnson Mr. President. He said, I've got to tell the press that John Kennedy's dead. And Johnson said, Mac, I think you better wait a few minutes. Let me get out of here and get back to Love Field because we don't know whether this is a conspiracy or not. Communist plot. He called it a communist conspiracy. That's right. And uh, so Kilduff gave him a few minutes and then came upstairs. And when he stood behind this desk in the nurse's training room, he opened his mouth, and for a, I, almost a full minute, nothing came out. He was trying to catch his breath and tell us. The announcement was very brief, about one sentence. He said, President John F. Kennedy died at 1 o'clock today, Central Standard Time, in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound to the brain. And I have nothing further to say, and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> Chaos, everybody went for the phones, and we phoned the story, and that's how the, the announcement was made. While I was... Uh, announcing the president's death officially, I was grabbed from behind by a uh, White House transportation officer. His name happened to be Jiggs Balver. And he grabbed my collar and started pulling me away from the telephone. And I said, you, uh, what are you doing? And he said, I need you right now. We need a pool. And I said, it's not my turn. It's Bob Pierpoint's turn. I remember I started arguing with him. He said, I need a pool right now. Don't ask any questions. So I said to my office on the other end, I was actually on the air, and I said, I've got to leave now. I'll get back to you later. And he took me down back to the emergency room area. Merriman Smith of United Press International and Chuck Roberts of Newsweek magazine were waiting. They had been alerted downstairs. They put us into an unmarked police car and slammed the door, and they told him to take off. We took off from the hospital, and we approached speeds at 70 miles an hour, going over the median strips, over lawns and everything. And we said, where are we going? He said, we're going to Love Field. And we assumed at that time that we were going to uh, be seeing this, the swearing in. And we were the three pool reporters that were selected, helter-skelter. It wasn't my turn, but 
Smitty would have been there, and Roberts was picked out of the out of the crowd just to get somebody there. We arrived at the field, and I, I remember the policeman. Uh, I asked the cop driving the car, which is stupid. I said, "Would you call your office and tell them where I am?" <laughs> and and uh, talk about self-importance. He said. Uh, <laughs> He said, no, we're maintaining radio silence. I'm not allowed to talk on the radio because we don't know how many shooters there are around. So we got to the field, and just as we got near Air Force One, they were un unloading the hearse with uh, John Kennedy's body, and Mrs. Kennedy was helping the Secret Service take it up the stairwell in the rear of the plane. And the casket was too big to get through the doorway, and the Secret Service finally got inside, and they got an ax, and they had to knock off those door had those handles on the sides of the casket to get the casket inside. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kennedy stayed with the casket, got in. We, Smith and Roberts and I ran around the front of the airplane and up the stairs and we, inside, we asked where the president was and they said he's a midships and there was a compartment back there where uh, a group of people had gathered, the Kennedy staff, the young, very young people on the Kennedy staff. These are people who worked the campaign. They, they were crying, and it was a terrible tragedy for them. And there were some Johnson friends in the room, Albert Thomas, a congressman from Houston, uh, Jack Brooks, another congressman. Jack Valenti, we didn't know who Jack Valenti was, but he was picked out of the crowd. He was working public relations for the Johnson team. I counted 28 people in the room. I started acting as, a, as the pool reporter to try to get as much information as I could and started writing as fast as I could. I don't know how much, I don't want to dominate this. But no, this is a, a key story. We've already had the two key st Oops, stories here. And uh, so please uh, uh, finish it up. What, well, what happened was that uh, I, saw, I saw Lyndon Johnson standing there and Mrs. Johnson. Uh, he turned to uh, his secretary, Marie Famer uh, Chiroto is her name, married name now. And he said, would you like to go and ask Mrs. Kennedy if she would like to stand with us. Now, those are the exact words he used. And so Marie left the room and went back. Mrs. Kennedy was now in the rear of the, the, rear of the airplane, about on a 707 where the bathrooms would be in the back. That's where they were sitting with the casket. And Marie went back there and she asked Mrs. Kennedy if she wanted to come up and stand with the president for the swearing in. She said, yes, but I'd like a few minutes to compose myself. So Marie came back and reported that to Johnson. Meanwhile, I started taking notes on who was in the room, et cetera. And uh, there's a woman in there I'd never seen before. Turns out she was a federal judge named uh, Sarah Hughes. She's 67 years old. And uh, they just grabbed her downtown, put her in a car, and rushed her out to the field. And uh, within a five minutes, Mrs. Kennedy appeared in the compartment. I couldn't see all of her. I saw her head, and Lyndon Johnson went over to her, and you, both hands, he took her by both hands, and as he backed up slightly and moved her to the center of the room, he placed her on his left, and he placed Mrs. Johnson uh, on the right. And at that point, uh, I, I could see the gruesome nature of the president's wounds. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy's stockings, particularly on her right stocking, was, had blood that had already congealed. Her skirt had blood on it, her wrist and her, her hand, her right hand had blood on it. And uh, I would say that she, uh, she had her wits about her. I don't, she was not in the state of shock. She knew exactly where she was. She knew exactly what she was doing. But she was wide-eyed, if you've seen the pictures, and, and uh, unblinking, uh, just standing there, uh, taking it all in and knowing. I think that she knew that she had to be in that room for the swearing in. And I found, I found that to be very, patriotic and courageous at the same time, that she would leave the casket and come into the room in that condition. Meanwhile, the sobbing grew louder now as she came into, into the picture in front of everybody in this compartment. And then most of the young, the young women, the staff people that we knew in the press office and throughout the White House, the mascara streaking their cheeks. And you can imagine the feeling you had in that room, that the temperature in that room was over, well over 100 degrees. The plane had been sitting on the ground for an hour or two uh, under a, a brilliant sun. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, was as calm and resolved and firm as I've ever seen any man. He was in total control. He knew what was going on and what he had to do. He had already called Washington. He'd already had, he had two phone calls with Bobby Kennedy with the Attorney General's office. I should point that out. Bobby Kennedy was at home 
when Bobby Kennedy heard that his brother had been shot, he did not go to the office. So they patched him through the Justice Department to President Johnson on the airplane. There was a, that was one call where he discussed with Bobby whether, where they should uh, take the oath. And the Johnson people told me uh, that, the, that Bobby said, take it there. And Johnson and he agreed. A second call was made to Nicholas Katzenbach, the Deputy Attorney General, and the same instructions came to Johnson, take the oath there. So there was no question in my mind uh, that Johnson was not trying to rush back to Washington, have the oath given before they got back to Washington where there's been some conversation about it. Uh, the president asked for a glass of ice water, more ice than water. I was standing right next to him when I heard him and uh, Marie brought him some ice water and he turned to Judge Hughes and he said, uh, proceed. I counted 28 people in the room. The White House photographer, Cecil Stoughton, who was a captain in the uh, Signal Corps, uh, was backed up against a bulkhead. He was, his, his back was pushing the bulkhead so he could get everybody into the picture. President Johnson said to the Kennedy staff, would you see if any more Kennedy people want to come in and attend this, the swearing-in ceremony? And I think a few more people tried to pack themselves in. He was very compassionate toward Mrs. Kennedy and toward the Kennedy staff to make sure that, it was, that, that uh, they had an opportunity to be there with Mrs. Kennedy and, and watch the ceremony. It took 28 seconds to deliver the oath. The uh, president uh, uh, turned to his wife and kissed Mrs. Johnson. He turned to Mrs. Kennedy and he kissed her on the cheek. He went over to Mrs. Uh, president Kennedy's secretary, a woman named Evelyn Lincoln, and he embraced her and uh, tell, told her he was very sorry about what happened. Uh, there were people approaching him in the room, a lot of, there were some Texas congressmen and others who wanted to approach him to shake his hand, and he waved, <coughs> he waved them off. He uh, tried to avoid any sign that this somber ceremony was a celebration of any kind. Mm -hmm. The only person I saw that got to him was Chuck Roberts of Newsweek, one of my colleagues. And Chuck went over to him and shook his hand. And Chuck told me later, he said, I looked at him and I didn't know quite what to say. And then I said, Godspeed, Mr. President. And I thought, boy, I wish I could have said that. The, the, the thinking that Chuck had at that moment. It was the right thing to say at the right time. He'd and then they started buttoning, but, buttoning up the airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, Malcolm Kilduff, the secretary, press secretary, came to me and said, you and Roberts are gonna have to flip to see who rides back. There's only two seats left. Smitty gets one of them because he's wire service. You two guys are flip. And I said, no, I won't flip. I wanna get off. I wanna file a story. And the rule is if you're a pool reporter, you have to give the other reporters in the group a story before you use it. And, but I, I did not wanna be in the air for two and a half hours in my office waiting to hear from me. And the good thing about it was that Chuck Roberts working for Newsweek they didn't go to press for 20, more than 24 hours, so he could use the, the, the time for a color story of what happened on the airplane. Uh, in disputes and stories afterwards, uh, Chuck Roberts disputed every bit of criticism uh, about Lyndon Johnson that was put in the papers about his behavior on the airplane. He was with it, he called President Kennedy's mother, he called members of Congress, he wrote a uh, speech that he would deliver when they landed in, in Washington. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy was seated with the casket and never left the rear of the airplane until they landed in Washington. At one point, someone came to Mrs. Kennedy and said, uh, would you like to change into something more comfortable? And Mrs. Kennedy, uh, the quote was, uh, no, let them see what they have done. So she stayed in that dress all through the flight back to Washington. Air Force One landed here at 5.55 p.m and the casket was removed from the airplane and President Johnson delivered a very brief statement on landing at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, the pilot was Jim Swindle, uh, had flown with Kennedy just about since the time Kennedy took, took office. And uh, I was told that uh, Swindle violated the uh, rules for flying a 707. This was a beautiful airplane, incidentally, the first one of the, that color scheme which was designed by Jack Kennedy and, and uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. They chose the colors with an architect, uh, uh, I can't, he think he designed railroad engines as well. <laughs> Raymond Lowy was his name. Okay. And uh, Swindle took the airplane up above 41,000 feet, which was a little unusual for a plane that size. The plane was fully loaded with fuel, 
because they didn't know where they were going to land. If it was a conspiracy, if there was trouble in Washington, there was some foreign country involved, they had to be prepared to go anywhere, so they were fully loaded. And I watched the airplane take off. I got off the airplane with Judge Hughes, and uh, we both watched the airplane go down the end of the, as far as he could go down the end of the field to get as much runway as he could. It was a humid day as well, so he needed more runway. And both of us watched the Air Force One disappear, the eastern sky to disappeared into a dot. And you couldn't help but think uh, about the Constitution and the strength of the country and the, the terrible day it was. You had the new, newly sworn president in the casket and the other president in the casket and uh, the widow of the president beside him. So it was a, I can't describe the day other than to say it was one of the saddest days. At the same time, you felt proud that we have a transition, had a constitution that worked the way it did. Let's go back to the, what was going on in Dallas. You're winding down now. It was a bedlam in the newsroom uh, trying to put this story together. And did they put your story on page one? No, uh, <laughs> they didn't. Uh, you know, it was very unusual. It was, uh, people look back and say, why did she call the Star-Telegram? We, we, we have no idea why she did. The, the best guess was that when Oswald had defected to the Soviet Union, we had done stories about it. And she was kind of an itinerant. She'd moved and lived in many different places. And that may have been the only connection she had with the local community. But while we thought it was unusual and, and a little bit strange for her to call the paper, uh, the papers in those days were so much a part of the community. There was no security uh, that you know, people would walk in off the street if they had a complaint about something that was in the paper, and they'd walk right up to the city editor. The guy who, the vendor who sold the Star Telegram down on the corner in front of the paper, his name was Monroe Odom, if he didn't like the headline on the first edition, he'd come up and complain to the city editor. Say, I can't sell papers with this kind of a headline on it. There was just this kind of intimacy between the newspaper uh, and the community. So uh, it was. It was odd, but it was not unbelievable mm -hmm. that she would, she would have uh, chosen to call the Star-Telegram to look for a ride. Jim, what was it the, like in the... the well, the, the, uh, it was, it, it was uh, the chaos continued because it was the chaos of trying to find out what in the hell happened. And then we get pieces of information. For instance, in, in, in today's world, I, w I made a terrible mistake at when, in the middle of the afternoon in, uh, on the at the police station. That, and if I made that mistake in this world of today, I probably would have lost my job. I tell the whole thing on a telephone, you were talking about how important it was. Well, I had isolated the telephone and it's, that, that a FBI agent had commandeered. And, he's, and, and he, it was his, he was doing it for the FBI. I happened to know him. So I would, I would go over to, and it was out of, out of sight of other other reporters, so I went over, I went over to call the call rewrite my newspaper. I picked up something, and uh, um, and he, uh, and then I put the phone and I, I said thank, put the phone back down. And I said to him, I said, uh, is anything going on? I don't know. You know, you know, just you know, tell me something, anything. And he said, well, I hate to tell you this, but uh, you know, they killed a Secret Service agent too. And uh, don't know about Conley. Don't know if he's going to die or not. But uh, the uh, Secret Service agent was killed. And I said, uh, he said, Yeah. He said, Yeah. And this said, this clearly came. It was clear to me later when I parsed it. This came from somebody at at, at Parkland because they saw the blood and all of that. And uh, that Clint Hill had you know had covered up and he had blood all over him and all this sort of stuff. And somebody had at any rate, I called the city desk and I said, Okay. Uh, I just ha I have it from a authoritative source. I didn't say an FBI agent, but it was from my point of view, it was an authoritative source, and a, and a Secret Service agent was also killed. And of course, in today's world, that story would have gone like that. Right. Uh, fortunately, uh, even though I was, we were moved, we were doing specials and we were doing extras and we were doing everything. One of the, and they, they were ready to go with this, uh, you know, in, in, the next, in the next edition, they were putting out new editions and about every, every 60 or 70 minutes. One of the guys on rewrite later 
I, he later told me, he said, I, I saved your ass and your job. And I said, thank you so much, because uh, <laughs> I, need, I need both of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> At any rate, he, he, what, what he did, he, he'd already written the story, that a Secret Service agent had been killed and all that sort of stuff. And then the, he had, he just happened to, he, he was, you know, he was getting something, getting from, from one of our guys at Parkland, and he said, hey, look, we're, we're about to go with, uh, Larry's got the story, you know, they're about to have the dead Secret Service agent. He said, there's no dead Secret Service agent. He said, well, that, I'm telling you, there's no dead Secret <laughs> Service agent at, at Parkland Hospital. There's a dead president and he's this and whatever, but there's no dead Secret Service agent. And so this rewrite man, on his own, he goes to the city editor and says, forget it. And you, to forget a story like that, I mean, that takes, I mean, you know, anyhow, city editor said fine. And they cut it. They, they cut that whole thing out of the, out of the thing, as I say, save my wawas. And, uh, but <laughs> in, in this day and time, now, and that happened all day and all night. Uh, there were things like that. And when I, I, just, I just came, I, mean, I spent, as I told Bob, I spent 10 days, in, last 10 days in Dallas, and one whole day, symposium. And with a lot of, there were a lot of the reporters uh, who were around for both newspapers and around were part of the symposium, and we talked about a lot of this stuff. And, and, uh, we, and I agreed with them. One of them said, you know, it's remarkable that we made as few mistakes as we yeah. did make. Because cause the, the information was just, you, talk, you used the word tsunami. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the news was coming, down, coming into our newsroom like a tsunami, and you didn't know and somebody had to make a decision. Eventually, you know, that's one thing about journalism. Eventually, you can't say, hey, I, I, you can't wait another second. You've got to go with it. And, uh, and it's just remarkable. In retrospect, I agree with one of the guys told me yesterday, Saturday, you know, he said, good God, Jim, look, I mean, the mistake. I was talking about my mistake. He said, look, it's amazing we didn't make huge mistakes about it, you know. You know, I, I think one thing that, it's, uh, that it's, it's good to talk about is, you know, up until that point, uh, most people saw the news product, and then most of them saw it in the newspaper. They saw the story and the picture that had been cropped and the story that had been edited and had been vetted and was printed on, on, on the newspaper. But this was really the first time that the American people had seen the news being gathered in the process by which news gets into the papers or gets on television. And what they discovered was it was not altogether a dignified process. People shoved, they pushed, they hollered. Uh, stories got out there and were quickly pulled back. Uh, this was the first time that any of that uh, had been seen uh, by the American people. Up until that point, every survey showed that most people in America got their news from print, from newspapers, from that weekend on after the entire nation focused for the first time on one story at one time. From that weekend on, television became the dominant medium where most people got their news. This was a great change uh, in, in communications and how, how the uh, country uh, got its news. But the idea, as Jim says, that all of this was happening and it had never happened before and nobody had ever seen this thing happen as it unfolded that day on television. On those, along those lines for the younger people here, the networks, the television networks and even local radio canceled all programming and for the next uh, four days, virtually almost four days, uh, the music you heard on the radio world was funereal music. You didn't hear any jazz, mm -hmm. you didn't hear any of that and uh, it was all news about, about the assassination. It was a very solemn period. The networks lost an estimated $40 million in canceled programming because they knocked all the commercials off the air for that uh, period from Friday through, mo through Monday night through the funeral. I heard a story in, in Dallas over the weekend that I had never heard before. You know the famous Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that was taken by Bob Jackson in the Times Herald of the Ruby killing uh, Oswald. There was also a Dallas news photographer right there by him. And his photograph, when they each went to their dark rooms, neither knew whether they had it or not. The thing had been on television, but they, you know, the, uh, and it's a long and Bob's story that Bob knows about how they got, the, the Dallas News picture was taken slightly later 
that. In other words, Jackson's picture came literally as the shot was being fired. The Dallas News picture was right afterward, or maybe it was right, maybe it was the other way around. The other way around. Other way around, right before. He was there, but he hadn't fired, he hadn't fired the thing. This is just, just to illustrate how traumatic this was for everybody, how important all this was for individuals. I heard the story, and they later, and several people confirmed it to me. Jackson, who, I, who was at this thing where I was over the weekend, he's fine, he's great, he won the Pulitzer Prize and all that. That Dallas News photographer, who did not win the Pulitzer, never recovered. He never was able, he never smiled again, he never, he continued to be a photographer, but he never was able to function with the same verve and vitality because as he said many, many times apparently to people, uh, I missed the Pulitzer, I missed the photograph of my life by one click. <laughs> by one click. And, and let me tell you just one little sidebar on that. <clears throat> when the Dallas News photographer took that picture, the Associated Press headquarters in Dallas was in the Dallas News. And the AP photo editor took that photo, and there is controversy to this day as to whether he had the permission. Anger, anger to this day. Had the permission of the <laughs> Dallas News to, to put this photo, but he took this photo and put it on the AP wire with a copyright 1963 Dallas Morning News. When my bosses over in Fort Worth saw that picture move on the wire, this is before they knew about the even better one that the Times Herald had taken, they decided to put out a Sunday afternoon extra. Now, nobody had ever done this before. This wasn't a, uh, a, you know, an extra edition of a, of a newspaper that was already out. They weren't going to put out an extra of the Sunday paper. They decided to put out a whole new newspaper Sunday afternoon, and they did, and they put that Dallas, <laughs> the Dallas News photo right there on the front page within little six-point agate type Copyright 1963, Dallas Morning News, got it out, put it on the trucks, and got it on the streets of Dallas before the Dallas News got on the streets <laughs> with its own paper with their picture. And we thought that was one of the biggest scoops of all time. All time. But that's how it, it was in those but days. But a huge dispute still exists, I discovered, over whether or not Jackson knew he had it and what he said when he ran back into the newsroom. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing that people still, well, oh, everybody yeah. remember. Whether he said, I've got it, or he said, I don't know if I've got it. And everybody held their breaths, apparently, in the newsroom. And they went to the dark room. They, were very, they guarded it like, you know, like it was Fort Knox and all that sort of stuff. And when he saw the picture and he yelled, and, you know, in the yell, apparently, I was, I was out. Out on, out on the street. I mean, he had the picture of Ruby sticking, sticking it in it. his rib. And you can see, you can see the smoke from the, from yep. the, up close, and blown up shot, you can see the smoke from the revolver. I mean, it was that second. And, but the Dallas Times Herald photographer was just a fraction of a second later, and he saw the reaction on Oswald's face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. famous yeah. photo. Yeah, so. yeah. And, the, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, they, that gets us into looking, you all went on to extraordinary careers, and uh, as did other people who were covering it, like Dan Rather. Um, I once had a theory that success in journalism could be measured by what street corner in Dallas you were on on November 22nd, 1963. What impact did covering this story have on, on your career? So let's start with Marianne. Well, it didn't hurt. <laughs> 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 but it hurt a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm a print person. Right. And all these stories about fighting for pictures and visuals and TV was already moving into our business. And I couldn't find a phone when, when Sid found phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that, so. Sid, uh, well, I, I think the pool report that I gave, uh, you have to understand that when I came to Washington, most of the reporters covering the White House were World War II war correspondents. Uh, they were the greatest generation, as uh, Tom Brokaw said. They were just wonderful mentors. They were good to you. Uh, they may, may have called you kid or something. I was in my 30s, and Merriman Smith called me kid for a long time after that. 
but I did have, I did have, uh, I, I think that I did have uh, some benefit from it with my company. I didn't screw up on the pool report. I was scared to death. I got everything right uh, that I was supposed to get right. And I was scared that I might not do that. And uh, the only thing I did uh, at the end of my broadcast, I came back to Washington on the press plane and uh, Bonnie arrived at the White House uh, about four o'clock in the morning. And uh, it was in a Navy ambulance. It was in a Navy ambulance because Mrs. Kennedy did not want the body brought back to the White House in a hearse. There's something about the Kennedys that they never think about death. If you go to the library, you can see it. You don't think John Kennedy's dead even today. But uh, they were going to put the the body in a, in a hearse at Bethesda Naval after the post. And a Secret Service man went down and talked to the young officer that was in charge and said that Mrs. Kennedy would like to have an ambulance. And the officer said, well, it's in regulations. We can't put a dead body in a uh, ambulance. And the Secret Service agent said, son, I think I'd get an ambulance if I were you. <laughs> and uh, it was an ambulance. And I, uh, it was an eerie night. They put the kerosene lanterns uh, up the northwest part of the driveway to the north portico. The military district of Washington, uh, which works with precision on events like this, they're trained to do this, had already draped the portico with black crepe. Mm -hmm. uh, the casket. It was placed on a catafalque that was similar to, but not the Lincoln catafalque. The Lincoln catafalque, incidentally, for, for historical purposes, stays at the Capitol, and the one at the White House is a copy of it, and that's where they placed the casket. And when the, hearse, when the uh, ambulance came in the Northwest Gate, I could see Mrs. Kennedy sitting back in the, in the back of the uh, ambulance with her hands on the casket. A Marine Honor Guard and uh, other Armed Services people were formed ahead of the ambulance, and they marched in funeral cadence up the driveway with the ambulance following. It was now about 4.15 a.m. There was a November chill in the air. The leaves were off the trees. These lanterns were creating a, a very appropriate uh, atmosphere at the White House. And I was closing off the broadcast. I was broadcasting with uh, a colleague, Ann Corrick, who was had covered Washington for a long time. And stupidly, I decided to quote from Robert Frost's Walking by Woods on a Snowy Evening, which John Kennedy used to use when he was running late in the campaign. He would say that the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, that I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. And I decided to use those words, which was a mistake. And I, that's where I, I, after 16 hours since Kennedy had died, that's where I broke up on the air. Now, you two uh, went on to extraordinary careers, plus you switched to television from print. So t tell me a little bit about th th what impact this had on your career. Yeah, well, it, in my case, uh, it didn't have a lot of immediate impact uh, because everybody who was a reporter in Dallas was involved in the story and the coverage. It wasn't a special we didn't have any, uh, nobody had a special ownership of that, of, of the Kennedy assassination story and all of us, everybody was involved. It had a huge impact on me as an individual journalist because I was four years, uh, I was, I'd been a reporter for four years, uh, but I learned that early, at that early stage as, as a result of the Kennedy assassination and it's part of now my, my DNA as a reporter, just how fragile everything is. Bob said it a while ago. This is something like this had never happened before in modern in my my lifetime or in modern day times like this. And uh, to realize that that in 15 seconds a lone person could get off three rounds and change the course of history was stunning. Mm -hmm. And and having been part of that story, I I Bob and I've discussed this before. I'm a fanatic. Uh, at the news hour, and I was later when I became city editor of the Times Herald. I'm a fanatic about every damn phone call that gets rung is get gets answered, and because uh, in a moment everything could change again. There could be another another event. Part of my thinking, 
And it's that been that way in a very strong way uh, since November 22nd, 1963. You know, I, uh, the turning point in my career, if, if there is such a thing, was <clears throat> was not this story, but the next year, well, 1965, when I went to Vietnam for the newspaper, I came back and uh, the local TV station invited me to come out and talk about the war on a talk show, and afterward, uh, they offered me a job, and it was $20 a week more than I made at the paper, and that seemed like a lot of money. <laughs> and so that's how I got into TV, I always say. <laughs> I got in it for the money, uh, <laughs> and it and it all worked out pretty well. But like <laughs> like Jim, it was not so much the impact that this story had on my career as I think really the the impact it had on my psyche. Uh, you know, it, to to see this young and vigorous man, I mean, uh, cut down in a matter of seconds by the bullets fired by a madman. I think it just for me, helped me to understand the preciousness of life, and I think, um, I think in many ways, it caused me to, from that day forward, to sort of, to try to cram as much I, as I could into every, into every single day of my life. I probably crammed in some things that I should not have, but I, I, I kind of, from that day on, live my life as, a, as if each day would, would be the last one. And I think it was because of that. I also learned a great deal uh, about myself during that. It was about two weeks after all of this had happened and I was on the police beat. And I, you know, you see a lot of death and a lot of bodies when you're, when you're covering police. You certainly did in those days. And I was at this particularly awful automobile accident. A family had been killed when their car had run under a truck loaded with pipe. And I was standing there looking at these bodies, and I realized I had no emotional reaction whatsoever. It was almost like I were a little dog watching television or something. You know, I saw the lights, I saw the movement, but I just, it didn't register with me. And I kind of realized, and after I thought about it, that whatever I had inside of me that causes you to empathize or sympathize or react to events, I just sort of used it up during that two weeks. And it, you know, when you're a reporter, and many of you in this room are, you know that when you're covering these stories, you just do it one thing at a time. You focus on what's in front of you, you try to find out about this, and that takes you to that. And, and it's not until it o it's over that you kind of realize uh, kind of the toll uh, that it takes on you. And I eventually got that back, but it, but it really did take a while. And I never again felt that way uh, until 9-11. Until and you know, as reporters, we're all trained to do stories about other people. But when it's our own community, when it's our own friends, when it's our own family whose lives are in danger as they, they were uh, during 9-11, it's an entirely uh, different thing. So I think the impact for me was I learned a lot about myself, I think. Uh, during that, that period, I'm, and I still think about it. I still think about it often. I, I, would, I would say amen to that in terms of myself, but I would add one other professional thing to it that I learned as a result of, of the Kennedy assassination coverage and being, my being part of it is just how really important it is to get it right as you possibly mm -hmm. can. There, and the, the, the story I told about the dead FBI uh, Secret Service agents, a small piece of that, because I stayed on this, that story for eight or nine months, as I said, and, and every day they wanted another story about who did it, what's the conspiracy. And uh, it, was, it was so easy just to kind of get on page one with just about anything. And I really learned the hard way uh, that, you know, wait a minute, Take a deep breath. Wait a minute. Take a deep breath. Wait a minute. Double check. Do you know, it, two two sources isn't enough. Maybe two hundred isn't even enough. And uh, getting it right is a hell of a lot more important than getting it first. And uh, I learned that beyond a shadow of a doubt on uh, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and I've never forgotten it. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, let's have one more question before we <coughs> briefly open it up for questions because we are running out of time. Why are we still talking about this? It's only November 4th, and the amount that's been written and televised is huge. 
I bet no one was sitting here at the press club in 1951 doing a retrospective of the McKinley assassination. What I is sure it? as hell wasn't. <laughs> Why weren't you? What, uh, what is it about this assassination, this, other than Lincoln, this was, you know, the biggest, it's the story that just never dies. Can well, I think it was John well, Kennedy. It'll never die for me because I looked into that convertible. That's right. And saw it covered with all these little white flakes that were his brain. Okay. I mean, how many times are you going to do that in life and walk mm -hmm. away and not forget it? That's right. Well, uh, it, I will never forget it because uh, I covered John Kennedy from the day he became president. Uh, the excitement of John F. Kennedy in the White House. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, I don't think he had a prayer or an idea that we could land a man on the moon in the 1960s, but he said we would and we did. And I think that was a part of the excitement of being covering John F. Kennedy and the excitement of his inaugural speech, uh, watching him uh, through the failure of the Cuban, uh, the uh, Bay of Pigs, right. and then a year later, the triumph and victory over the Soviet Union on the missile crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I will never forget what happened on the, in the back of that airplane. I did not know Lyndon Johnson and when he was vice president. I never covered him, but in that compartment, with those 28 people uh, under the pressure he was under to watch his behavior. Uh, here was a man that was underestimated, I think. He was, after all, a majority leader in the Congress. He had, a, he had a life of his own. He was a master of the Senate, as Robert Caro has said. And we saw it all happening that day. He took charge. He did it uh, resolutely and with compassion. And I'll never forget that. What I'd like to say, too, uh, we live in a town where we're watching government workers getting beat up all the time. I want to say something about the Secret Service and Clint Hill in particular. Clint Hill is a Secret Service agent you've seen in the Zapruder film who dashed from the Queen Mary, which is the follow-up car. He was, running on, he was on the running board and on the left side of that car when the shots rang out. Uh, Clint has told me that uh, he only heard two shots. He didn't hear one of the shots, but there were three. And he saw Mrs. Kennedy on the trunk of the car. He had to make a choice when he ran for the presidential limousine. His first instinct was to run for the president's side because that's who he's supposed to protect. He realized that the presidential limousine was going too fast that he could, could not get to the right side, so he started for Mrs. Kennedy. And there are no running boards on that car on the presidential limousine. But there are what they call footholds. They're little stirrups. You can put your fit, feet inside of them you're, as you would a slot. And he tried to get his foot in it, and he almost stumbled. And if he had stumbled and fallen into the street, the follow-up car weighs about five tons. It would have run him over, and Mrs. Kennedy would have been thrown off the trunk. But he was able to get his foot into the foothold and his hand onto a handle, which yanked him onto the car, got on top of the car, pushed Mrs. Kennedy back into the seat, now, a lot of people wondered why Mrs. Kennedy was on the trunk of the car. Was she frightened by the shots? She wanted to get away from the, the danger? The fact is, as Clint has told me, she was reaching for a piece of the president's skull. And that's how she fell out of the back seat and got onto the trunk. Later at the emergency room, a story I've heard from an agent was that she walked up to one of the doctors and she had a piece of the president's skull and asked one of the doctors if this would be of any, any help. Clint Hill spent 40 years in depression, uh, not being able to forgive himself for the fact that Kennedy died. Uh, drinking in uh, his family room hours and hours every night for almost 40 years. Mm. He has written a book. He's, now he's got two books out, and he's recovered totally from that. He's doing very well. But he's a genuine Mrs. hero in my, in my book. He's a, been a good friend for many years. I remember seeing him somewhere uh, several years ago, and he came up to me. It was, a, it was a funeral service for a Secret Service agent. And he said to me, Are you, do you believe that bullshit that I'm in depression and I'm drinking? And I said, I don't know what to believe. He said, well, it's not true. The fact is that it was true. And he's much better for it today. That's good. Uh, uh, he, he, the, Clint Hill's salary, annual salary at the time of the assassination was $4,900 a year. 
The book is called Mrs. Kennedy and Me, and it's wonderful. Now, why, uh, uh, Bob and Jim, why do you think this has, this story just lives and lives and lives? Go ahead, Jim. Well, I think Bob pretty well said it a while ago. I mean, and it was just a young president struck down. That was part of it. Also, because it was the first shared, shared tragedy like this, too. Uh, everybody sat in front of telev their television sets and saw all of this and, and experienced uh, the ritual of, of the burial and, and, the, and the funeral and, and the grief. And we, everybody cried together. It was now possible to do that because of television. And uh, it, was, it was the ultimate first domino of tragedy that, that struck this country. Uh, there were two other assassinations after that. Then there, then there was Vietnam, and then there was Watergate, and that, and then we go on through school shootings, and 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 to 9/11, and now we had the Boston Marathon. But it, the first one, the first one, that struck everybody so personally, uh, uh, everybody uh, was uh, was the Kennedy assassination. You know, and I think it that's was the reason we remember it. The country was never quite the same after this happened. I've often said I thought it was the, the weekend that America lost its innocence. But we had come out of World War II. We were very confident. Uh, we thought our presidents were somehow superhuman. Uh, we thought they could overcome anything, that they, they were almost invincible. And then in this matter of seconds, all of that changed. This did set off the most tumultuous 10-year period in the history of this country, with the possible exception of the Civil War. It was a period when we came to question everything that we had taken for granted up until that time. We questioned our institutions, we questioned our politicians, we questioned uh, our government. Questions that, for so many of us, all of these things had been taken for granted up until this point. But from that weekend on, all of that changed. The other part is, there are so many questions. Uh, there, there are still questions about the Lincoln assassination. There are still questions about the assassination of Julius Caesar. I think it has pretty well been established that Lee Harvey Oswald was the gunman. No one has ever presented evidence to me that convinced me that anyone else was involved or that there was a conspiracy. But even after we say that, we still don't know why Lee Harvey Oswald did it. I think he did it because he was deranged, and I think deranged people do deranged things, just as the, the kid that went into that movie, the Batman movie, and shot those people, or the kid that did what he did up there at Newtown. Uh, he was a deranged person, but we still have no rational explanation beyond that as to why he did it. And I think one of the great tragedies is that when Ruby killed Oswald, we were not able, the government was not able to put him on trial, and I think many of these questions that we now have would have been, would have been put to rest. But this was a marker in American history. And I think that's why we remember it, and I think it is well that we do remember it on this 50th anniversary. Now, that's an excellent way to end. Uh, but I, I'm going to, with some trepidation, open it up for just a couple of questions, because we have already gone an hour and a half. I have uh, two young students here who have microphones. There's a question over here, Elizabeth, and uh, you want to, uh, and uh, Nicoletta. Uh, quick question. Uh, from Mr. Lehrer, you said that you were the one who walked up to Oswald, and he said, I didn't kill anybody? Yeah. When you heard him say that, did you believe him? Oh, I was beyond believing or not believing. That wasn't my job to believe him or not believe him. I mean, I just reported it. I, didn't, I did not know whether this was the right guy or the wrong guy or yeah. whatever. I wasn't even thinking along those lines, uh, other than the fact that they had arrested him and they were uh, I, I assumed, as you did at that point, that he probably, I probably assumed that, I probably assumed that he did it, but it was not, I wasn't, I was before the judge and jury stage in that case. Okay. Uh, let's go over here, there's one right there. 
I'm interested in whether you have whether you think there's any uh, chance of truth in the the theory that one of the Secret Service agents in the car in back of of the Kennedy car actually was the one who fired the third shot with a rifle, and that that was the shot that actually killed Kennedy. Mm, and right there's, that's correct. There's, there's no, a big no. story no. going about the, on that. There was I'll two hours you, on television last Su night. Susan, I'll give you the Secret Service answer to that. The fellow that they're supposed to supposedly fired that shot was in the last row of seats in the follow-up car, which was facing to the rear of the motorcade. There is no way that he could have fired a shot that it would have uh, it didn't happen. got hit. It's didn't just happen. amazing what people will put on television. No, no offense, guys. <laughs> <laughs> There's one back here, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Thanks. I've just been reading uh, Robert Caro's book about uh, Johnson, and um, it's just in really in almost incredible that it happened because he was saying how he was worried he was going to be dumped, that Connolly was kind of taking over the uh, Texas uh, uh, Democrats at that point. Um, what was your reaction in the, in the Dallas news area about suddenly here uh, Johnson is president when, uh, did, was he considered uh, pre uh, popular or was that just an incredible? Uh, he was overwhelmingly popular. I mean, you know, and the fact that President Kennedy was coming to Texas and he was bringing Vice President Johnson with him, uh, he, they were overwhelmingly received, you know, uh, both, both the Johnsons uh, and the Kennedys. And the idea was that they were coming down there, uh, number one, to raise money. They were going to go to all these cities and wind up in Austin because they knew you couldn't get somebody from Fort Worth to go to Dallas to a fundraiser, or you couldn't get somebody from Houston to go to San Antonio to a fundraiser, but everybody would come to Austin, which was the capital. And that was why that would be the last stop uh, on this trip. Uh, they were also trying to get, it was not any kind of a rivalry between Johnson and Governor Connolly. They were on the same side. It was a rivalry between Governor Conley and Ralph Yarbrough, who was the liberal senator, and Kennedy was determined. At one point, uh, Yarbrough wouldn't even ride in the same car with Governor That's Conley, right. and finally, uh, President Kennedy had to tell him either ride with Governor Conley or, or you're, you're out of the parade. In a different car. And uh, so that was another part of it. But the main reason, uh, when you get right down to it, they were trying to raise money. They, they thought there was a lot of money that could be raised in Texas, and they'd come, come to Texas to do just that. Just take two more, because I know it's getting very late there. The one here, Nicoletta? Hi. Um, this may sound like a dumb question, but I'm not a Texan, and I was born after this all happened. Um, why, would, why were they flying from Fort Worth to Dallas? I mean, it's not that far. Well, for security reasons. Sure. Okay. It, it's, it's 30 miles. It's 30 miles. It, took you, it would take you about an hour, you know, with the sirens and everything blaring. You could get over there in 40 minutes. But it was a 10-minute hop. And you go from Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, where they'd spent the night, over to Love Field in Dallas. So that's why they did that. And there wasn't, it wasn't like it is now. There was nothing there between Dallas and Fort Worth at that point. Just a couple of small towns. Mm -hmm. It's now, it's wall-to-wall -wall city. And you could, yeah, you, you could do an urban motorcade from Dallas to Fort, Fort Worth to Dallas, but you couldn't then. Or they might have gone by helicopter now. You yeah. Know, they'd rather than go in, in Air Force One, yeah. but that uh, was why. Uh, Elizabeth, did. why don't you get this uh, gentleman over here? <laughs> Thank you. A little more global question. You mentioned some anachronisms, editors, <laughs> Rewrite. Today in a breaking news situation, national news outlets quote, Twitter feeds from not reporters, but Joe Bag of Donuts. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I, I think it's good. I think, uh, I think there's a big upside, you know, to social media. I mean, you no longer need a charismatic leader to have a revolution. Look at what what happened in Egypt, but I think there's also a downside to this. I mean, the number one downside to social media is now all the nuts can find one another. And that has turned our politics, our national security, uh, and a lot of things upside down. 
there also is no longer a whispering campaign in politics anymore, like when Jim and I used to. I always tell the story about 10 days out from every election I ever covered in Fort Worth, you'd always get a report that one of the candidates had a girlfriend that lived on the east side. Or a boyfriend. And I don't know, well, we didn't know about that in those days. But in, in those days, all the girlfriends lived on the east side. I don't know why that was, but they, but they all did. And, you know, uh, people would be whispering about it, and we'd go check it out. And if it was true and it amounted to anything, we might do something about it. Most of the time, uh, we never did. Now, if you had a, r a rumor like that, somebody would just put it on a blog, you know, and it would be out there. And then... It's not just a problem, it's not really that much of a problem for mainstream media. We use that like a tip or something. We check it out. We would never publish something like that unless we checked it out and found out if it were true. But for the candidate, the candidate has to decide whether to ignore it and hope it goes away or confirm it and then give it wider distribution and put it into the mainstream media. And that's what, that's what people in politics and in journalism are now are now dealing with. I mean, the internet has not just changed our culture, it's turned communications upside down. And, you know, our whole definition of privacy and, and all of these things uh, are just, just totally changed now. But this is a much broader problem than just, you know, tweeting out when you think you have a news story, which is a problem in itself. You can't believe anything now until you check it out. But, you know, that should be the way it's always been. But now, you know, it used to be uh, when we were all growing up, you said anybody who had a barrel of ink and a printing press could call himself a publisher. Well, guess what? You don't need the barrel you of ink it. and the printing press anymore. <laughs> anybody that's got a computer right. is a publisher. Yeah, and we're all learning how to deal with that. But the attitude of professional journalists toward that stuff has got to be those are, Bob used the term, that, those are tips. That, those are sources. Those are not stories in and of themselves. And as long as the professional journalists understand that and react that way, we'll be fine. Sometimes we're not, and sometimes we're not so fine. Let's make that the last question in the back there. Well, thank you very much, all of you guys, for showing up and giving us this enlightening speech. Um, I, myself, am extremely enlightened. Um, to close it all off, I wanted to ask a, a bit of a, a kind of different question. Um, like you said, uh, this event caused a downward spiral into the t into the ten years that were um, in there were more um, almost more tumult. I mean, just about as one of the ten most tumultuous years in the in the history. Of I'm America. not sure it caused it, but it was the first in a the series first. of yeah. these things. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if what 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 would you think would have actually happened if this tragedy had did not occur? How would America have? How would the course of America have gone? if this not, had not changed the course, uh, changed its course. Well, how would I, if this what, had not what, happened? What was the question? What, what, if Kennedy had lived, in other words. If K Kennedy had lived, how would it change? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. But That's somebody why it's so important well, to I, talk about it. We don't I, know. Uh, I've read all these, uh, what we call thumbsucker stories. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that you could make a judgment. First of all, they said if Kennedy had lived, and run in 64, he would have ended the Vietnam War. You have to understand that Barry Goldwater would have been his opponent. And if the country was a little more conservative than that, number one. I just don't think it makes any sense to guess about what he would have done because it, he didn't do it, and I don't think anybody knows. And it requires... Uh, in reference to that, let me, uh, let me finish one second. This, this is per perhaps apocryphal, but... There is a story that Lord Hume, the foreign minister of Great Britain, was meeting with uh, Mao Zedong, and the same question came up. What would have happened if Khrushchev had been assassinated instead of John F. Kennedy? And Mao supposedly rubbed his jaw, thought for a minute, and he said, well, I don't think Mr. Onassis would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good place to end here. <laughs> I want to thank our terrific panel. Thank you. Thank you.
been very generous with your time, and uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you so much. That's the best story of the night. Yeah.